the day the Lord has made. Amen. Welcome to First Denton, a church where lives are being changed through Jesus Christ. I'm Darren. I'm the executive pastor. We're so glad you're here, whether this is your first time here or maybe you're a longtime member. You know, there's a divine purpose for you being here today. I believe it. That God wants to speak to every single one of us in a profound way. In just a minute, Pastor Keith and the whole choir and the worship team and orchestra is going to lead us into a time of worship where we can lift our voices together to the one true God. And then Dr. Jeff will come and he's going to give us an inspiring message that's going to apply to our lives so we can leave here changed and go out into the world and make a difference. Amen. You know, if you are new here today, I just want to encourage you to do something for me. Look in the seat back in front of you and you'll find a connect card. We'd love to hear about what brought you to our church. How can we walk with you in your faith journey? You can let us know how we, we can pray for you because we believe that we're called to pray for one another. And we also believe something important. God answers prayers. And so please let us know how we can pray for you. And if you are new, I'd encourage you to go by our welcome center when the service is over. It's just to my left. And uh, we'd have a gift for you. We have a welcome gift. We'd love to meet you in person. Um, if you're looking, watching online, please go to firstdenton.church and you can give us all that info there as well. And speaking of welcome each other, we want to take just a minute to welcome each other here in the service. So do me a favor, stand up, look to someone around you. Maybe you can introduce yourself to someone new. Tell them how nice they look this morning. You know, church, the songs that we sing are loaded with scripture. I love it. It says in this next song, Awake my soul and sing for him who died for thee. That is directly out of the Psalms. We will sing and make music to the Lord. Let's sing, crown him with many crowns. Sing with us.
Our God is a holy God. He's so worthy of praise. Worship the Lord with us this morning. Sing the song.
sing a song now along with our praise team it's a great new song it's called honey in the rock and it really talks about God how he provides for our every needs I'd like to read to you the scripture that comes from it's Psalm 81 and it says oh that my people would listen to me oh that you would follow me and walk in my paths for my desire is to feed you with the finest wheat and I will satisfy you with wild honey from the rock God is the one that provides for our needs. He meets our every needs. And we sing praise to him this morning through this great new song, Honey in the Rock. Praying for a miracle, thirsty for the living well. Only you can satisfy Sweetness at the mercy seat Now I've tasted It's not hard to see Only you can satisfy There's honey in the rock Water in the stone Manna on the ground No matter where I go I don't need to work Everything I need, you've got this honey in the rock. Freedom, when the Spirit is bounty in the wilderness, you will always satisfy.
keep praying, you keep moving. I keep praising, you keep proving. I have all that I need. You are all that I need. I keep looking, I keep finding. You keep giving, keep providing. The 249 episodes of Andy Griffith's show ran from 1960 to 1968. How many of you remember uh, those shows when they first came out? All right. You know, I was four years old in 1968, but I do remember watching that show. Probably most of what I watched were the reruns after 1968. It was my favorite show. I named my first dog Barney. Uh, Barney was a wiener dog at Dachshund. And uh, so I just, I really resonated with, uh, with that show. But I think Andy Griffith would tell you that his desire were that, that those shows would promote what we would call good, wholesome values. Things like honesty and humility and patience and, and helping each other out. And each of those episodes really focused on one of those attributes, one of those good values in our society. Now, you look at today, fast forward, 2023, and look at the television shows that are on today. You don't see things like honesty and, and humility and, and patience and kindness. You know, instead, you see prom promiscuity, you see violence, uh, you see those kind of things. And I don't need to tell you uh, that television reflects our society, and I would say television in some way shapes our society. Uh, you know, to try to make us think that things are, are okay and right and, and the norm. You'll see those on commercials. You'll see those on television shows and so forth. And what we have today really is sort of the antithesis, you might say, of what the Andy Griffith Show tried to promote uh, years and years ago. And I think that's why it's such a timeless show. You know, it's been 50 years since the last episode uh, aired, but yet you can still watch a couple episodes almost every day on the TV Land Network and other places. And, you know, we do value those values, even though they're not promoted like they used to be. 
Airline pilot came over the, the PA system and said, uh, uh, I need to let you know uh, about something that's been happening here on the plane. For the last three hours, we've been flying without the aid of radar and navigational systems and, and, and even uh, radio uh, with the tower. Uh, and because of that, uh, for the last three hours now, we have been, in the broadest sense of the word, lost, he says, and not really knowing where we're going. But on a brighter side, I want you to know, we're making great time, he said. Unfortunately, that's how a lot of people in our world are today. They have no idea where they're going. They have no idea where they're headed, but they're making great time to get there. How do we figure out where it is we're going? How do we promote, if you will, these, I'm going to call them Mayberry values uh, that the Andy Griffith Show tried to put out there, more importantly, biblical values that God wants us to follow. Well, Galatians chapter 5 tells us how to do that. Go ahead and open your Bibles there today. Today is the final message in this series on the Holy Spirit. We've talked about being filled with the Spirit. We've talked about spiritual gifts. We've talked about what the Spirit, Holy Spirit is and, and how He works in our lives. Today, we're going to finish up this series by talking about what the Bible calls the fruit of the Spirit. And when we read it in just a few moments, uh, you're going to recognize the things that are the fruit of the Spirit are very much akin to those Mayberry values that were taught in that show some 50 plus years ago. I think God wants these things in our lives, and we're going to learn today, how do we do that? How does the Holy Spirit generate and produce these things in our life, this fruit of the Spirit, and what happens when that happens with us as we follow Him? So Galatians 5, we're going to read verses 13 through 26 this morning. Would you stand with me this morning in honor of God's Word? And let's read this passage of Scripture that tells us about the Holy Spirit's fruit that He wants to produce in our lives. So Galatians chapter 5, we'll begin at verse 13. Paul says, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you divide and devour one another, watch out that you're not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. Father, we thank you for the joy of being together today to worship you, to lift up your name. Thank you, Father, for your word and the opportunity to read it today. Father, we thank you for the power that it has just to read it, just to hear the words of the Bible read out loud, Father, and how they affect us, how they shape our lives. Father, would you take these words today and would you teach us about the fruit of the Spirit, how you want to produce these things in our lives so that we can make a difference in others' lives as well. So teach us, Father, through your word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So several times in those verses, Paul says we are to live by the Spirit. That's the key to what we're going to talk about today. The key to having the fruit of the Spirit in your life, having those things evident in your life, is to live or walk by the Spirit. Uh, And the way that we do that, he says, simple as well. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you do that, you will walk by the Spirit, or walk by the, the Spirit, and you will have those things produced in your life. Now, you notice also in this passage that Paul talks about a struggle. A struggle that is going on in your life and in my life. Tony Evans calls it a civil war taking place in our lives. And the war is between the flesh and the Spirit. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, we learned a couple of weeks ago that the Holy Spirit instantly comes into your life. He is dwelling in your life. And so He is there, but the flesh is also still there. 
Although we come to know Christ, although our sins have been forgiven, the flesh is still there. We still have that drawing to that. We have that, uh, that struggle now going on between the flesh and the Spirit. The flesh is our desires to please ourselves, to take care of our own selves. The Spirit, though, desires to lead us and for us to walk in that. And so we have this struggle that goes on between the two. And the thing is that you get to decide which one wins. You get to decide if the flesh wins and you give into that. You try to make your own desires. You try to come up with your own pleasures. Or you let the Spirit win, and then He produces these things we just read about there in the passage. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Nine of those things that are called the fruit of the Spirit, and we'll specifically talk about that in a few minutes. But that's the desire. That's the Holy Spirit's desire to produce those things in your life. But this struggle is going on, and we've got to deal with it every single day, hopefully letting the Spirit win and produce those things in our lives. So that's what we're going to kind of deal with today. So take your outline. Let's jump in here. Because I want to start off by talking about how our sin causes a power failure within our lives. So we've got this struggle going on. The spirit versus the sinful nature. The spirit versus the flesh. And when we allow the things we read in verses 19 through 21, I believe it was, uh, the, the things of the world, the things of the flesh, that's when the power in our life goes out. Now, before we came to Denton, uh, the Williams family was in Pleasanton, Texas. And while we were there, we lived in a church-owned house. Now, that's sort of a thing of the past in a lot of churches nowadays, but they had what they called a parsonage. And so when we moved in there, they let us live in that house while we were there. Now, the, the parsonage at First Baptist Pleasant was a very nice house, big house, bigger house than we'd ever lived in before. Uh, but it was built in the 1960s. Now, this was 1993, but they had remodeled it. And so it was very nice. It had new paint, new carpet, and all this thing. And so it was a great place for us to live. But not long after we moved in there, I figured out that the doorbell did not work. Now, every house needs a doorbell, right? Uh, you know, somebody needs to be able to push that button and ring that doorbell. It didn't work. So I started to try to figure it out, try to get somebody to come fix it. I tried to get an electrician to come to the house to fix my doorbell. Now, have you ever tried to get an electrician to come to your house to fix a doorbell? Let me just give you a hint. Don't even worry. Don't even try. Now, they don't want to mess with doorbells. they got a lot more important things to deal with. Uh, but every once in a while, I would think about, oh, you know, the doorbell's not working. So I'd find an electrician. I would call, and they'd say, hey, I'll get back to you, and they never got back to me. Two and a half years this went on of trying to get my doorbell fixed. I wouldn't think about it for three months. You know, I'd think about it again. And finally, one day, I figured out that in our church was a retired master electrician. His name was Ernest Moore. And when somebody finally told me about that, I went up to Ernest one Sunday. I said, hey, Ernest, I said, the doorbell has not worked at my house for two and a half years. You think you might can help me out? He got a big smile on his face. He said, absolutely, I'll be over there to do it soon. Now, I'd been told that before, so I was a little skeptical. But, but sure enough, one day he showed up, and he kind of surveyed the situation. And he says, okay, I'll be back to fix your doorbell. And sure enough, on a bright and early Saturday morning, Ernest showed up to the door. He had to knock because the doorbell didn't work. I went to, to let him in, and he had wires, and he had new doorbells, and he had transformers in his hand, and he was ready to fix the pastor's doorbell. So he and I went up into the attic where all that is up there. Now, get, remember now, Ernest is about 82 years old at the time. But he's up there, and we go make our way over to this spot. And, and it just so happened the doorbell was in the exact same spot where I had stepped through the ceiling of the attic a few months earlier. Ernest knew about that. And so I said, Ernest, now be careful. This is where I stepped through. He looked at me. He says, you're the one that needs to be careful. And I said, well, you're right about that. But, but anyway, so we got all this stuff. We got his tools. We got these wires. We got the doorbells. We got all of this. And we get over there, and there's this little device. And, 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 and when we first looked at it, both of us immediately noticed there was a wire that was not hooked up. Ernest simply grabbed that wire, took his uh, screwdriver, turned it in, and guess what? The doorbell worked. For two and a half years, the thing had not worked because one wire was not plugged in. There was no power going to that doorbell. Once the power was hooked up, everything was great, and now the doorbell worked. There was a power problem with my doorbell. Well, guess what? A lot of us today have a power problem in our spiritual lives. We don't have the Holy Spirit filling us. We don't have the Holy Spirit producing these things we're going to look at in a, in a few minutes. And because of that, because of the sin in our lives, because of the things that we have been, been doing, we don't have the power that God promised us we can have. 
and that we should have in our lives. So as you think about the fruit of the Spirit, you've got to first of all think about sin. Because we've got to confess that sin, uh, as, uh, as 1 John tells us to, uh, knowing that God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We've got to deal with that first before then the Holy Spirit can then be produce these things we're going to talk about in our lives. So just know from the start, sin. Sin is that struggle within us. Sin versus the Spirit. Sin versus the fruit of the Spirit. Sin's going to win out until we confess it and move away from it and repent from it. Now next, the passage tells us, this reminds us about the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So sin causes a power problem, but the Holy Spirit then comes in and brings the power into our lives. Remember the first week when we started on this series, Acts chapter one, verse eight, maybe one of the most well-known verses in all the Bible about the Holy Spirit. Look again at what it says. It says, you will receive what? Say it with me, power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You know, if life was always kind to us, if everything was always rosy, if we never had any problems or difficulties, we probably wouldn't notice the fruit of the Spirit in our lives and other people's lives. But it's during those difficult times, it's during those hardships in our lives that the Holy Spirit needs to come in, most of all, and produce the fruit that God wants to see in our lives. So as we think about these fruit of the Spirit, these nine things, and again, we'll get to them in just a moment, but we've got to ask the question, how? How does the Holy Spirit do this? How does the Holy Spirit produce these things in my life and in your life so that others can see them because others can be blessed by them? I want to give you two passages of Scripture, right? Take your Bibles. Turn to Psalm chapter 1 right quick. Psalm 1. This is one of the Psalms that we looked at this summer as we did our little study uh, for a few weeks through some of the Psalms. Now I'm going to read verses 2 and 3 of Psalm chapter 1 and listen to what it says. Now listen, we're, we're trying to figure out how does the Holy Spirit do this? How does he bring this fruit into our lives? Look what it says. It says, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither in all that he does, he prospers. So do you see it there? You see, the way the Holy Spirit brings this fruit into our lives is when we read and we meditate upon God's Word. You see, it's God's Word that produces the fruit of Spirit in our lives. And I think it's a key that he says, not only does he read it, he meditates on it. You see, we've got to meditate on God's Word. We can't just read it and throw it aside. No, as you read it, you know, that's the thing about reading God's Word. If you'll do that in the mornings, you'll think about it the rest of the day. It'll help you to meditate on it and to spend more time in it where it really becomes a part of who we are and a part of our lives. But that's how he does it. That's how the Holy Spirit produces these things in our life, through his word and through reading it. All right, now go back to the New Testament. Go to John chapter 15. So there's a verse here, a couple of verses here, that also tell us how the Holy Spirit does this, how he produces this fruit in our lives. John 14, I'm going to read verses 4 and 5. Listen to what it says. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, Jesus says, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So you saw in that passage, abide in me, abide in me. That's how we overcome the flesh. That's how the Holy Spirit produces this fruit within our lives. He overcomes it. Uh, he comes in and does those things. Now, let me just tell you this. You know, we talk about the flesh versus the spirit. Let me just let you know, you cannot fix the flesh. Okay? The flesh is not fixable. You can't fix your sinful nature. You can't fix your flesh. But what you can do is let the Holy Spirit come in and overcome the flesh in your life. And when that happens, that's when these fruits of the Spirit, this fruit of the Spirit begins to be produced in your life. Now, there's nine of them. We don't have time to go through them. I know all of you remember 2007 when I preached nine sermons on all of these things, and you remember all those. Uh, no, none of us remember that, but uh, we're, we're just going to do it all today in one. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you three categories, all right? There are three categories of these fruit. Uh, these, these nine things that are, that are evident in our life, right? First of all, the first category, I'm just going to call Godward relationships. 
Okay, so God were relationships. And it's the first three. Love, joy, and peace have to do with our relationship to God. And I'm just going to tell you, we'll, we'll just focus on the love out of these three. All right, so love, I believe, is first for a reason, because it's the most important characteristic. I mean, if there's one characteristic out of these nine that we say more represents God, it would be love. And remember now, the Greek language has several different words for love. The one here is the word agape, and it means unconditional. It means he loves no matter what. Whether we're obedient to him, whether we love him back or not, we love him, and we love others. And there's one characteristic that makes us more evident that we're Christians. It's love. Listen to John 13, 35. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. 1 Corinthians 13 is known as the love chapter throughout the Bible or in the Bible. Listen to just a few verses out of 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And then the last verse of that chapter says, love never fails. These three abide, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Now, I would say the absence of love really pretty much nullifies everything else. If we're not loving, then we're not doing these other things. And Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 13. You know, if I speak with the tongues of angels, if I uh, do prophecy, if I do all these other things, but I don't love... He said, then it nullifies all the rest. So I think it's important that Paul starts out with this one because we're not doing this. We're not doing all the rest. Love is about giving. It's about doing. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, say it with me, he gave. He gave. He did something. That's what love does. Love does something. It makes a difference in our lives. Now, the other two are important as well. Joy, for instance, uh, joy is that thing in our lives that's not dependent on the circumstances around us. Happiness depends on what happens to us, right? You know, if I uh, uh, you know, get to go eat at my favorite place, I'm happy. If my team wins, I'm happy. Hadn't been a lot of happiness in the Williams house uh, this year. Uh, but that's circumstances, not so with joy. Joy is not dependent on circumstances. Joy is dependent on Jesus only. And what he does in our lives. Peace is the other one here. You know, peace, this has the idea of unity, has the idea of security, the idea of ease. All these things happen in our lives when the Spirit is winning out over the flesh in our lives. So those are the Godward ones, the third one. The middle ones I'm going to call inward relationship. Things that begin within us that make a difference in our world. Faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. I'm sorry. Uh, patience. I'm sorry. I messed up here. All right. The second, we got to go back to the second one. All right. The second one is the manward relationship. I skipped one. The manward relationship. That's the middle one. Patience, kindness, and goodness. Okay. Patience, kindness, goodness. Love, joy, and peace. That's Godward. All right. Manward, how we relate to other people. Patience, kindness, and goodness. Let's talk about patience for a minute. In the King James Version, if you're holding that version of the Bible, it says long-suffering. As you think about that, long suffering, that means that I do something for a long period of time. Maybe I'm suffering through that as well. And I read one uh, writer this week that said that patience has to do with when you are being condemned, when you are being maybe wrongly accused or wrongly uh, condemned of something. Patience means that you don't look for revenge. You don't look to fight back. Instead, you just wait for God to work through that. You wait for him to take you through that time in your life. That's hard. That's difficult sometimes for us to do that. That's what patience is all about. You know, patience is that one we like to talk about, but we don't like to learn patience, do we? You know, be careful about praying and asking God for patience because he might give it to you and he might take you through what it is that needs to happen to get you there. Patience and testing in the Bible often go together. That's why the Bible tells us uh, that testings and trials can be good in our lives. That almost seems like an oxymoron, doesn't it? Trials, good, but that's not what the Bible says. Consider it all joy, my brothers, whenever you experience various trials and tribulations, Paul says. That's how God teaches us patience. That's how he gets us to where he wants us to be in that situation. Gentleness uh, is the second one there in that three. You know, in Matthew chapter 5, 
Uh, Jesus said, blessed are the meek. It's the same word here, meek and gentleness. And that word meek in New Testament times had a lot more meaning really than it does today in our times. You know, kind of the idea of taking a wild horse and taming that horse, that word meekness or gentleness would be used to describe that. You know, the power is still there. The strength is still there in that horse, but it's been brought under control. It's been tamed. And that's what God wants in our lives. He wants us to have strength. Yes, he wants us to have the power of the Holy Spirit, but he wants us to keep that contained. He wants to keep that where it needs to be so it can be used and make a difference in people's lives. Peter is one of those guys who had to learn meekness. Peter was one of those strong personalities, speak before he thought sometimes, and and God had to, to produce that gentleness in his life. He had to produce that patience in his life as well. Moses is another one. You know, Moses is a guy that was not meek to begin with. Uh, As a matter of fact, God had to take him out into the wilderness for 40 years to teach it. And be careful about praying for patience, okay? It may take 40 years for you to learn it. That's what it took with Moses. But God taught him that, and then God used him to make a difference. Self-control is the last one here. So much involved here in this. Somebody said the two things that keep us from self-control our physical appetites, and sometimes our mental attitudes. Listen to what Billy Graham said about self-control. This one may sting a little bit. Billy Graham said, compulsive overeating is one of the most widely accepted and practiced sins of modern Western Christians. He says, it's easy to condemn an adulterer, but how can the one who condemns do so when he is guilty of some other form of temperance, he says. We've got to be careful we got to be careful about how we say this sin is more uh, you know, prominent than another one in our lives. Uh, we've got to have that in. All right, so we've seen the, uh, the Godward ones. We've seen the manward ones. All right, thirdly then, I'm going to call the inward relationship. Okay, the inward relationship. Faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Uh, these three are those that we deal with other people. As we encounter people in our lives, it's these things they're so important. Let's talk about gentleness for just a minute. You know, with gentleness, uh, this is being able to deal with somebody in a way that's kind, in a way that's loving. You see, all these kind of things kind of go together, don't they? In order to be gentle to somebody, you've got to be patient with them. In order to be gentle with somebody, you've got to be kind to them. In order to be gentle to somebody, you've got to, first of all, love them as well. And sometimes that means, certainly depending on what your personality is, that you may have to hold back in some areas. If you're going to do that, if you're going to do that effectively in our life, in your life, but being able to do that and to say, okay, God, I'm going to hopefully deal with this person in that kind and gentle way. We already kind of talked about self-control, uh, that ability to hold back uh, when we need to. Uh, the other one being faithfulness. Faithfulness is simply doing what you said you will do. You know, we love people to do that, don't we? We don't think much of people who don't do that, do we? Somebody tells you they're going to come fix your doorbell and they don't come. You know, we don't think a whole lot of them. But somebody who's faithful does exactly what they say they will do. Now, look at those nine things. Look at them again there in your Bible. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Notice that Paul says, he calls these the fruit of the Spirit. He does not say the fruits of the Spirit. Now, that's kind of hard for us to kind of grasp that because there's nine things here. That's plural, right? That's fruits. But he calls it fruit of the Spirit. Let me tell you why I think he says that. I think he says that because I believe God expects every single believer in Christ to have all nine of these in our lives. Now, last week, we looked at the gifts of the Spirit, spiritual gifts, okay? Nobody has all the spiritual gifts, Some have one, some have two, some have another one. Uh, Nobody has all of them. But all of us as Christians are to let the Holy Spirit produce in our lives all nine of these things. Now, if we're all honest, we go to that list, you know, I'd say, well, you know, I I think I'm pretty good in this one. I'm horrible at this one. And Chip would say, you know, he's good at all nine of them probably. But he'd say, I'm good at this one or not at that one. All the rest of us say the same thing. You know, we've got our weak spots, we would say. Well, those are the ones we need to continually pray and ask God through the Holy Spirit to produce 
in our lives. So we've seen how the power gets turned off, right, through our sin. We've seen how the power gets turned on through our, uh, the, the, the Holy Spirit and His power in our life. So let's just kind of close with this then. How, how do we then uh, continue in this and walk in this each day? So walking in the Spirit engages the power. Sin knocks it out. Holy Spirit brings it back. But as we each day walk in the Spirit, walk in the Holy Spirit, that's when this power is engaged in our lives. Now, we all know about the law of gravity. Hey, the law of gravity is a pretty much universal law. Am I right? If I were holding something in my hand up here today and I dropped it, it's going to fall to the ground. What goes up must go down, right? Everybody agree with that? It was an Isaac Newton sitting under the apple tree and the apple fell, hit him on the head. That's how he discovered gravity. So the law of gravity is a universal law. You're not going to break that law. However, a 100,000 pound airplane can take off over at DFW and fly up into the air. We might say, well, how does that work? I mean, it looks like that uh, you know, kind of negated the law of gravity. Well, it didn't negate the law of gravity, but there's another law that can override the law of gravity. It's the law of aerodynamics. And if an object moves fast enough, an airplane, for instance, down a runway, and there's enough thrust there, that airplane can overcome the law of gravity for a period of time. Because once the power begins to go out, what happens? Boom, it comes right back down, okay, to the ground. Well, I think the law of aerodynamics is sort of like the law of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We're not going to overcome the law of sin. It's here on this earth. As long as we're here, until we leave this earth, sin is going to be evident in your life and in my life. It's just there. It's just a law. But the Holy Spirit can overcome that law. And the fruit of the Spirit can take hold in our lives and push sin over to the side as we're filled with the Spirit and as we allow Him to do that in our lives. And so the challenge for us as believers is to walk in the Spirit every single day, as Paul said right there in Galatians chapter 5. Tony Evans talks about growing up in Baltimore, Maryland. So he loved growing up there. And one of the things he loved about Baltimore, Maryland, and he still does when he goes back and visits, is steamed crabs, okay? Chesapeake Bay is there, and apparently millions of crabs are pulled out of there every year, and people there, you know, just love the crabs, and of course they get shipped all over the world, I guess, in different places. But he said when he was growing up, little boy, his dad, if he could afford it, on Friday nights when he came home from work, he would bring home some crabs, and they would steam those crabs, and they would eat those crabs. He said it became a family tradition, something to look forward to every week. Uh, as he was growing up as a little boy. But he talks about when they would cook those steamed crabs. Now, some of you are not going to like this, but I'm going to tell you, they cooked those steamed crabs alive, okay? They're alive, alive when they put them into the bucket. And he said what happens is kind of interesting because when you put those in there in that hot water and it begins to boil, those crabs, as you can imagine, want to get out of that boiling water. And so one will use its claws and begin to make its way maybe up the side of the deal to the top. But sure enough, about the time he's kind of up there, another crab will come along and he will grab him, trying to get up on top of him to get out, and they both will fall back down into the pot. He said they'll climb over each other, they'll use their claws, and basically what happens is they destroy each other in the process of trying to get out of the pot. Tony Evans says that's what Paul is talking about in Galatians chapter number 5. He says the people there in the church were pulling each other down. They were clawing at each other. They were keeping each other from becoming all that God wanted them to be. And he was trying, I think, through that letter to keep them from having that crab-like mentality in the church. And instead of the sins that he listed in verses 19 through 21, he wanted them to produce the fruit of the Spirit that we read about in verses 22 and 23. You know, I wonder, though, if Paul were to come to 2023 right here in our day and time, what he would think if he read some of the things that Christians put on social media and other things. Or maybe if he even heard the whisperings in some of our churches about various things. And, and, and I wonder what he would think about our crab-like mentality as well. When instead, what we ought to be doing is showing love and joy and peace and patience and kindness, gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. 
You know, I think we are, as Christians, are given the responsibility to be the fragrance of God, the fragrance of Christ in this world, in a world that stinks for sin. You know, John Beck and a couple of us, we play golf down here at Lake Park and in Louisville, and, and the ponds are real low right now down there, and they smell horrible. When you walk by there, it just stinks. But that reminds me, that's, what's, that's what sin is like in our lives. It just, it just stinks. It smells. But what we want, God wants to have is the fragrance of him in our lives. And when we allow the Holy Spirit to produce these things in our life, that's when we become the sweet fragrance of God in this world. You know, I think it ought to be the goal of all humanity. And when somebody sees my life, when somebody sees your life, and hopefully the Spirit is producing things in your life, when they see you, they think, that's what God must look like. That's what God must be like. That's our goal as Christians, is that others would see Christ in us. And when the Holy Spirit is producing those things, that's what they'll see. And they'll want to know why we're different than the rest of the world. And hopefully they'll want to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Father, I thank you today for your Holy Spirit. I thank you that he wants to produce the fruit that we've read about today in our lives. Father, would you help us to allow him to do that? That, Father, sin would not keep us from producing that fruit in our lives. Father, help us recognize we can't do it ourselves. There's no way we can produce these things. But I thank you that your Holy Spirit can. Thank you for these last several weeks, Father. We have learned from your word about your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that we would be filled with the Spirit. I pray, Father, that we would let the Spirit produce these things in our lives. Father, I pray for those that maybe don't know your Son, Jesus Christ, as Savior and Lord today, so they, the Holy Spirit's not in their lives. I pray that soon they would invite you to come into their life to be their Savior and Lord. So thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for what he does in our lives. Help us to let him work in our lives every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, First Denton family, Austin Wadlow here uh, in East Lansing, Michigan at the Commons Church. Guys, I'm sending this video for two reasons. One is I miss you guys. It has been a long time since I've been there and seen you, and uh, I think about you guys all the time. I hope you're doing well. Uh, second reason I'm sending this, though, is I just want to thank you. Thank you for your continued partnership uh, with our church up here in Michigan. Uh, this past Sunday, we just celebrated our fourth birthday, and uh, we are so grateful for all God has done these first four years. We had over 850 people here uh, between two services celebrating with us. Uh, two weeks ago when we kicked off our college ministry for the Year Salt Company, uh, we had 700 students crammed in this room. Uh, next week, we're having our next baptism service, and we are getting really close to celebrating our 200th baptism in these first four years. And I'm saying that to you because I want you to celebrate too. God has used you guys and your partnership uh, to help all of this happen. And so thank you for your partnership, but also uh, thank you for your continued partnership. And I hope you guys know not only should you be celebrating uh, helping start a church in East Lansing, but you should be celebrating helping start a church in uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan at the University of Michigan and also Greeley, Colorado at the University of Northern Colorado. Guys, through our partnership together, you are helping us with raising up people to send out to new places. And uh, this year, we helped launch a church at the University of Northern Colorado. Uh, they just kicked off. It's going amazing. They actually had over 100 students at their first salt company gathering. And last year, uh, you guys helped us start a church in Ann Arbor, Michigan at that other school down the road. We don't talk about them very much. Uh, but it is amazing what God's doing there. Um, uh, it's Yeah, it's amazing what God's doing there. And so thank you. Thank you for your partnership, and I'm serious. I miss you guys. I hope to come see you soon. Uh, love you. Dr. Jeff, Doug, all my family there, love you. Hope you're doing well. Hey, First Denton family. <laughs> hey, what a great uh, update, right, from Austin. If you didn't know, he was on our staff, an overflow pastor here for several years. And, you know, when you give and support our church, you're supporting churches like Austin's like the Commons Church and others all across the United States and missionaries all around the country and around the world. So we thank you. We thank you for your continued giving. 
you know, your faithfulness is what makes ministry happen, and we're uh, just so appreciative of that. And there's different ways you can give online, um, obviously through check. You can mail things in. We have offering boxes, but we just want to thank you for that. I have a few important announcements for you this morning. The first one is talking about a food drive. So the month of September, all month long, we're trying to partner with First Refuge to get them a lot of food for their food pantry. If you don't know, the food bank, it's been more difficult for them to get food of, of late, and the need is a lot higher. You know, we get updates from First Refuge all the time, and the number of families that they're ministering to keeps increasing. And so if you have food um, with you, maybe if you just brought some random food with you, that was really impressive. It was like a Holy Spirit thing. If not, all month long, come back each week and bring your food, and you can drop it off in the hub. The second one is a blood drive that's happening right in the parking lot. So the blood, uh, the blood truck didn't hub today. And if you want to give blood today, there's a great need there as well. So today would be the day to do that as soon as we're done. And the last uh, important announcement is about this card. Hopefully you got a card like this when you came in. Um, so we have in our church, our polity, our governance, we have three important standing committees. We have the nominating, personnel, and finance committees. And you can read a little bit about them on this card. But here's what I want you to do. Maybe you're here and maybe you've been, you, you have to fi- uh, meet the requirement of being a member for three years. But if you're in that category and you're like, you know what, no one even knows, but I've got some expertise in a certain specific area. We want to hear about that. We want to cast the net as wide as possible. And that's why we're offering you this card. You can nominate yourself. That's not weird to do. If you're like, you know what, God's been pressed it upon my heart. I'd like to step up and be considered to serve in one of these important committees. Please let us know. You can drop these. Uh, I think we may have baskets. You could also slip them in the offering boxes. And you have maybe some time to pray about it. You have until next Wednesday to let us know because we'll come together for a business meeting in October and then we'll be voting on the members um, for next year, if that makes sense. So we just uh, thank you for considering that. Maybe there's someone uh, and maybe you're married to someone who is like, hey, this person would be really great or there's someone you know in, uh, in your life. So do me a favor. Will you stand with me and we'll pray and be dismissed. Heavenly Father God, thank you so much for your church. Thank you, God, for all the people standing in this room. Thank you, God, that you knit us together and we are the church. So, Lord, help us to be unified. God, heal the places that need to be healed. Lord, as Dr. Jeff was talking about the fruits of the Spirit, Lord, show us the areas in our lives where we need work. And we can't do it on our own, so, God, may we invite you in to work on us to make us more like your son, Jesus, so that when we go out into the world, uh, people would say, what is different about them? To give us boldness to share our faith in a way that we give honor to you. We love you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.